Friends, welcome back to Cultural Savage. This week, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Jan Owen. Now, Jan is a grief counselor and the author of Fighting Forward. Jan received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Alabama with a depth study in leadership. Jan spent 15 years as a licensed and ordained worship pastor. She's also the founder and president of the Give Worship Project, a nonprofit which provided training for indigenous leaders. Jan graduated uh, graduate school with a master's in clinical mental health counseling. She owns a private practice specializing in grief. Jan, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Good, good. Well, you are a brand new friend of mine. Um, you, you just kind of said, oh, hey, I would love to be on your podcast. And I said, okay, yes, this is good. Um, so why don't you, I've, I've read your bio on your website, but I'd love to hear from you just what's some of your story, you know, how did you get to where you are, where you're at? Just tell us a little bit about you and the events of your life. Well, I'm 54. So how long do we have? <laughs> we, we, got, we got time. We got as much time as we need. <laughs> Um, you know, I feel like I started out in a very, you know, I mean, just a very average way, you know, just, um, grew up as an only child in a home with two teachers and, um, very solid church family, um, going, went to church, you know, three times a week, mm -hmm. sort of grew up with serving others in a lot of different ways modeled for me, or actually I was sort of taken along. So mm -hmm. that was always very norm, normal for me, expected. I, I don't know that I knew any different. Um, got married very young, had three kids, you know, served with my husband and youth ministry. And then um, really always felt called to ministry. When I was 12, I had a, you know, campfire experience, which I don't mm -hmm. make light of. Um, mm -hmm. I really believe it was genuine. Where I really felt called to ministry. Of course, I had no idea what that meant or looked like, and it never occurred to me as a 12-year-old girl in 19, what would that have been, 1978, mm -hmm. that the church really didn't even have a place for me unless I wanted to be a missionary. Um, but I raised, you know, I was raising my kids, and we were volunteering, and um, when I was, I don't know, my late 20s, I started leading worship, I had been like singing back up a lot and I mm -hmm. started leading worship at some church plants, which is always interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and was that one church plant that became, you know, most church plants don't, don't last. Right. Um, the first one did not. The second one, I was at 11 years. Um, and we literally went from 27 people to around 800 wow. when I left there. Um, yeah, it was just totally like, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Really. <laughs> it's like learn as you go, sort of. Yes. Um, came from a Baptist background, so very low church. Um, in the in a manner of speaking, no, you know, I've never been to seminary. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I served as a worship pastor for many years, and and loved it. I really I really loved that. I'm a vocalist. I really loved my work with musicians. I loved the team aspect of that. Um. We had a change in leadership, a tragedy, which is mm. uh, our pastor's wife died by suicide. Um, mm. And that was, well, that just changed everything. We had a change in leadership. Um, it just deeply impacted our congregation, as you might imagine. Yeah. And when the new pastor came, really all of staff was sort of systematically replaced over time. Mm. Um, not really fired, but, you know, it just happened. So. I started a nonprofit, uh, just had been really kind of touched by some of the work we had done overseas. And I, you know, I really struggle a little bit with how this is viewed now. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes there's like this idea, like, you no know, savior thing. I never really felt that way. I always felt like it was a chance to partner with um, brothers and sisters in Christ that maybe um, just maybe wouldn't have had some resources. And so right. I, most of what I did was in, I worked in Rwanda and in India, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Uganda, um, most of the time in Rwanda. 
Um, and I would just go back and do, I don't know, I had, I'm gonna call them conferences. That's what we called them. <laughs> but they were just <laughs> like in a, you know, like way out in the village somewhere, a small church and people would come from miles and walk. And we would just do, um, I never taught how to sing or anything like that. We just mm -hmm. did a lot of, you know, sort of like leadership development, encouragement, talked mm -hmm. about, you know, the spiritual aspects of worship, a little bit of song, you know, songwriting, um, a lot of prayer. And mm -hmm. so I did that for a few years. I didn't, maybe you might imagine I made like zero dollars doing that. So, um, <laughs> right, right, yeah. um, and then in 2012, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and my husband was very unexpectedly diagnosed with a very rare form of kidney cancer. Mm. The first oncologist we went to had to look it up in a book. Wow. Yeah. They don't know much about it still. About a hundred people a year are diagnosed with this in the United States. They really don't even have good, they don't really know. It's so rare. They're not really even sure. Right. Um, he was only 47, 48. I guess 48. And, um, and from the first moment, they said, you know, this is terminal. Mm -hmm. And so to backtrack just a moment, my work in like Rwanda, Uganda, uh, those were with a lot of genocide survivors. Mm -hmm. um, that's not why I went. That's just sort of what I was exposed to. Right. Even in Guatemala, there was, it was a genocide in the 80s. And so you had, a, that was a part of their history. Um, I do believe that was sort of in my friend's suicide and then this work with groups of people that had been deeply impacted by community grief, really, I mean, personal and community. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt like I really, you know, I don't know, absorbed, learned, was exposed to things mm -hmm. during that time. So when my husband got sick, obviously I couldn't travel anymore. He passed away in 2014. Um, mm. You know, I had the question, what am I going to do with my life now? Yeah. Um, ministry had not been always very kind to me as a woman. I am ordained and licensed in the Southern Baptist Church, which mm. is incredibly unusual. Yeah. Um, the church that ordained me now will tell you that they do not ordain women. They will even deny that, um, which has been very sad. That's been very hard yeah. for me. But I knew that that door was probably not really open for me, even as I got a little older for that reason as well. Worship pastors, you know, I don't, I, I yeah. wasn't cool <laughs> anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't play guitar. I, mean, I do, but not in front of people. So um, right. anyway, all the, I, I make a lot of jokes about it, but it was like, really, it was obvious that this time in my life, there was like some new direction to go in. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what that was. I had never finished my college degree. I was working on it. And so I finished that up, my bachelor's, and um, really felt impressed to go to grad school, but really had no idea what. I just thought, what? You know, um, and really over time, that became very clear to me as I prayed, um, as I sort of developed a heart for, I felt a calling towards people that were grieving. Um, mm -hmm. In my own experience, I saw how, poorly the church often responded to grief mm -hmm. um i felt the own my own i don't know frustration or or, or uh, i'm not sure what word to put with it but like the feeling like perhaps it was like the opposite of faith seen mm. in some circles like if we grieve you're not having faith or something yeah, yeah. that is that that wasn't working for me at all and so um i really felt this calling so eventually i went back to grad school and i got a master's in counseling and I did my in, I did some training some extra training as well in grief work and I interned in a uh, nonprofit that only provided grief counseling and so I worked with people who had lost loved ones in a variety of ways um, mm -hmm. you know more natural causes and then also very violent you know murder right. drug overdoses suicide and that kind of thing so uh, I graduated at the ripe age of two weeks from being 54 and, mm. uh, <laughs> and up into nonprofit and up into private practice a week before a pandemic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but, you know, I'm making it and um, yeah. I'm finding that the conversations, you know, arise that they're very, the work is still very sacred and still very mm. holy. 
Mm -hmm. um, the net, the conversations that arise in my office are um, deeply spiritual. Mm -hmm. So it feels similar in many ways. It's not exactly the same, but right, you know, there's right. some similarities there. Yeah. So, so it's left me with a real heart for uh, that intersection of faith and mental health and mm -hmm. um, you know, even how can the church as a body respond in a more gracious and healthy way? Yeah. Trauma and things like that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm really familiar with it because I, I have bipolar too. Yeah. Um, and I've grown up in church and I know how it was not addressed not even how right. it was addressed, but how just nobody talked about it. Nobody suggested anything. So I wasn't diagnosed until I was 28 because mm -hmm. nobody thought to be like, you should go see a counselor. You should go to the doctor. You should, because that's not what happens. Oh, right. Hold on one second. Dad, What's up? Mom told me I didn't wash my hands, but I said I did. But you did I'll be right back, Jen. I need to sure. parent for a moment. <laughs> I understand. Uh, um, vaccinations today and he is not feeling his normal self even more so so yeah. he's doing his thing well I have three kids that are all adults now but I have been there 
<laughs> I mean, like I've been, I've had little kids, you know. So. I understand. Yes, yes. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you for being patient. I'll edit out the the silence. Don't worry about that. Oh, yeah. No um. So I'm curious. How have you seen this idea of a collective grief? How have you seen that sort of manifest itself during this pandemic? I mean, you opened up your practice right before. So I imagine that right off the bat, you were dealing with people that were feeling this sort of grief is the only word I, I have for it about the normal about what's going on I mean how have you seen that manifest in, in in people's lives or even in your own life I mean it takes on a form of, of its own yes and we need to recognize that in our bodies so well what at first I didn't see as much you know I just would see individuals and it wasn't coming up quite as much I think because people thought well it'll be over soon. You know, I think there was this idea that like, okay, we can do this for a few months and then it'll right, be over, right. right? As time went on, I began to see people who had lost people to friend, you know, family or whatever to COVID. So you had that, but also even in just a, um, any kind of death, like say so like maybe mm. the death wasn't to COVID, but what I saw was like, you know, like how this interrupted people, anyone that lost anyone during this time, right? They weren't able to have the support. They didn't, weren't able right. to have people around them. Early on, they couldn't, some people could not even have funerals. Mm. Um, sometimes there was like a sort of like a shame surrounding if it was a COVID death, like there was sort of like an embarrassment maybe or something um, that seemed to come up. But what I've mainly seen is like people can't cope. They don't have the support they normally would. They don't have the morning rituals they normally would. And then they also don't have like any normalcy. So like, there's not even like things they would normally do that might help them sort of get back in the um, swing of life, you might say, like going to lunch with friends or, you know, just random things like just uh, going to visit family at Thanksgiving, clients that really, really wanted to not be alone. And, but you know, they, they didn't, they won't travel. And so now they're alone on their first holiday after losing someone. So that's that's sort of how I'm seeing it, like within people have, who have suffered loss. As a society, I think I see two things. And the people that are taking it seriously, uh, I see a an exhaustion, which is really mm -hmm. common in grief. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of a lack of... I don't want they're not like totally hopeless necessarily, but there is like this weariness, you know, like mm -hmm. just how long can we set aside normalcy in order to conquer this? Um, and so there's, you know, our, we don't have some of the things that we normally would have that sort of like fill us, you know, like the, like time with friends or family or just, everything we do is twice as hard because we're trying to work and homeschool a kid and, and, um, or rearrange how we work. You know, I had to totally right. like clean out a room and, you know, outfit a space. I had just gotten into an office and I literally <laughs> turned right around and had to yeah. do an office at home. And so, um, and we did that. And of course I don't have children at home. So that there's a less complication of that, but like, even then you have like all the extras, like worry about money and people losing jobs and, you know, mm -hmm. I'm remarried and my husband is retired from teaching, but he was working a, like a part-time job to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, help us make ends meet. And I mean, they immediately closed their doors like yeah. within weeks. Yeah. They just went out of business. So um, you see just all the extra pressures and stress. But the other thing I see, and that's hard to talk about, right? Like sometimes people talk about it, but it's like, it doesn't feel like it's not like when someone dies, we can point to this moment. Mm hmm and instead, what we have is this sort of accumulation of losses that aren't, you know, they're sort of ambiguous in a way, you know, like nobody, you know, um, they're, they're harder to put your hands on. And I think yeah. harder to be gracious to yourself in the midst of because you're like, well, you know, nobody died. I'm just having to figure out how to work from home or, um, right. you know, we're not starving, but yet things are tight, whatever. But the uncertainty of the whole time has just kind of, I feel like it's just sort of like people are just 
they're like if norm i think you know maybe people's anxiety is staying here all the time right instead of bumping up to here like it normally would so i see that but i also see this thing you mentioned earlier we have to name it um i see a lot of people that aren't willing to even name it they're not even mm. willing to address it they're not even willing to say this is actually happening and you cannot grieve what you do not admit you have lost Does yeah that make sense? well that totally makes sense mm -hmm. i see um, that and so you have people that are like kind of being more like you know paying attention and saying oh yes and then you have these other people that are like no it's not you know they're kind of denying it so so then right. they're not admitting it and they're also sort of it kind of it sort of dismisses the people that are yeah you know struggling and i don't know that's such a weird thing it's a yeah i mean it, it's it's hard when people deny your grieving mm -hmm. in whatever form it is by either saying oh it's not a big deal or or doing the whole that happened to me, but it wasn't that bad. And yeah. you know, people like I had the flu, it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering though, in, in your own personal life, um, so I, I've, I've grown up with grief. My mom died when I was two and a half. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've known death of friends and death of family. And I mean, it's just, it, it's been something that I've lived with. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering, you mentioned your, your your friend's death by suicide, you know, the genocide you were around, your first husband's, the, the loss of your first husband. How have you learned to both live, because grief doesn't, okay. grief kind of, um, grief stays with us. It doesn't necessarily dissipate and turn into nothing um but how have you learned to live with grief and how has that prepared you for the pandemic if that makes sense yeah um well as hard as this year has been i will say it's not the worst year i've been through and so sometimes I do look at it that way. There is some perspective, you know, um, in the sense of this is no fun. And yes, I feel financially vulnerable, but, you know, nobody's dying. Um, mm. And so that I, that I don't mean that to sound like snarky. It's just that's what I say to myself sometimes. Um, yeah. I think also the perspective that comes from grief in general has made a lot of things really unimportant to me. And it's heightened the importance of things that maybe really matter to me. Mm. And so um, some things I don't, um, don't bother me as much as, uh, you know, sometimes. And then also, I, instead of trying to like fight it, you know, and deny it and mm -hmm. um, berate myself for it. Um, when I feel sad and when I have a day um I had something happen this week that was really hard for me and a reminder and kind of stirred up some things and I just had to let myself have my time with it and let myself cry and but grief is is something I'm very willing to say is happening to me or I'm will, very willing to admit and so I don't waste a lot of energy um beating myself up when I feel sad or when I have a day that I maybe need to take it slower. Um, and I, I don't, I think my, I adjust my expectations of myself accordingly. And sometimes I think that is hard for people that have never encountered, have never really gone through it because, you know, they feel like that's a weakness. You know, they may view that mm -hmm. as a weakness. I have clients sometimes that have been through horrific losses. And they're like, I just don't know why I'm do not doing better. And I'm like, is it a race? Like, I mean, are you not going to win a medal? Right. I mean, like nobody's competing here, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think just that my mindset is you're right. I think, I th and my mom has passed away also since my mm -hmm. husband died. And so I think um, it's just a part of who I am now. And I think I don't expect to be without it totally. Um, and so I think when 
it comes up or like when I feel sadness over like, you know, my kids can't come home. We're trying to be safe. So they're not traveling from Cal two of them live in California, not going to travel home for Christmas. Um, I can't try. I don't, can't travel there. They can't travel here. Right. You know, I don't try to deny that that makes me sad. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I don't try to like happy my way out of it. Yeah. I just, um, yeah, that makes me sad. And, and usually when I can, you know, grief needs, like I always say, when you feel grief, pay attention to it. You mm -hmm. know, like it needs some attention. You need to like honor that grief. That's, yeah. that's, a, I think it's a sign of love and a sign of this was precious to me and I don't have it anymore, you know? Um, and so I don't try to compare it and I don't try to make myself not feel it. I don't know. Does that sound really simple? Yeah, no, no, it, it doesn't. That sounds really good because we do try to compare our grief to other people. Like at least this didn't happen to me mm -hmm. or, I mean, I've done that myself. Like it's only been recently that I've been able to call my mom's death a trauma because mm -hmm. it was normal to me. Right. It's just, it's just what I knew. Um, and other people had harder things or why should I feel sad? It's been 38 years, like, you know, but I still feel sad about it. And, I think embracing that is is a beautiful thing. Um, so, so we embrace grief, name it, willingly walk through it. How does that intersect with this idea of faith that you talked about earlier? Kind of like how people see, if you, people in the church anyways, see this idea of like, if you're grieving, you don't really have faith because faith makes you happy or something. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't understand that thinking anymore, but <laughs> I've, I lived with it forever. And yeah, yeah. I mean, how, how do those two things sort of, how do they coexist? Like this idea of faith that gives hope, but we still have this grief that sits with us. Yeah, I think it's probably, you know, what our belief is about grief, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. I think we have a really twisted viewpoint. Um, you know, I, when a, not all my clients are grief clients, but I have a good many that are. And when they sit down the first week, the first time I tell them in a session is grief is not pathological. It is not a mental illness. It is not negative. It is normal. It is understandable. It is mm -hmm. actually appropriate for us to feel sadness over the loss of someone we love. Yeah. And so um, I think how grief is often framed, um, you know, it needs to be reframed, right? As, as I believe grief is how God made us, you know, like the grief part, like that's how, I mean, we wouldn't experience it if that's not how we're created as a human being to feel sadness and confusion and, maybe even some anger, right? When our reality has mm -hmm. changed and we lose something precious, like every, and if we believe that every life is precious, if we are pro-life, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak in that, if we want to use that term, yeah. Yeah, I realize it's loaded, but I'm saying if that is our value is that human life is valuable and precious, then of course, you know, to me, like it makes so much sense to say, well, of course we stop and we are sad and we honor that love and that life. And so I think often it's just viewed as like, you know, oh, like so my mother died of Alzheimer's. So I bet 200 people at her service and visitation said, um, it's, she's better off, it's better this way. And I just wanted to like scream because like, no, it would be better if she didn't have Alzheimer's. <laughs> it yeah. was with me, you know? So there's, um, she's in heaven, you know? And of course, as a believer, that does bring me comfort that my mother is whole, that my husband is whole, that there's no pain, there's no more suffering. That, that brings me a lot of peace and comfort. Mm -hmm. But it does not, you know, the thing that I think is Christians that often we are not taught to do, at least not in my tradition, the way I grew up and where I was most of my adult life, we were not told to hold sorrow and joy together. Like I can mm -hmm. be both gr grateful and comforted that my mother is in heaven and whole and made new, right? Mm -hmm. I can I can go to Revelation and say, you know, 
behold, I make all things new. And I can be so grateful for that truth. I can also be really sad that my mom is gone. And both of those things, I can hold both of those things. It's not an either or proposition. It's not, we don't have to like, if we're sad, that doesn't mean we can never have any joy. Or if we're joy, it doesn't mean we can never have sorrow. Like it's not, they're not even, I feel like I will hold both of those in my heart the rest of my life. Yeah. Because I mean, will I ever not miss my mom or my husband? I don't think so. Yeah. So I think yeah. that, I think that um, grief is so naturally spiritual or, you know, in the lingo of counseling, the counseling world, I would say it's existential, mm -hmm. which is just, I mean, it's just a, it brings spiritual questions to mind. Yeah. And so to me, grief can be, you know, like we can face like our deepest fears and our deepest questions. Like to me, it's not at all the opposite of, in my book, I wrote something like this. I'm quoting myself kind of here. <laughs> <laughs> something like, um, Grief is not the opposite of faith. You know, um, I believe God can, I, I believe God honors our grief. You know, um, I think about Jesus wept. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, if he knew he would raise Lazarus from the dead and yet he wept. I mean, talking about holding two things together at once, right? Yeah, two, yeah. Yeah, so... I, I just, I feel like there's such an, I mean, to me, it has certainly driven me my, to my knees and made me ask some real hard questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not threatened by that. I don't, I mean, I don't think God is threatened by that. I feel like that's where it's, my faith has maybe been the most authentic. So what happens when we stifle grief? we try and stuff it down and pretend that like I've grieved for a week. I'm, I'm okay now. You know, what happens to us? It comes out somewhere eventually. Oftentimes it comes out. Um, addictive behaviors, mm. um, anger, a lot of anger. I see a lot of people, it eventually comes out in anger, um, depression, uh, relationship problems, inability to um, attach, you know, like in other words, like maybe an avoidance of intimacy later with in like in right. relationships um, because you're fearful. Um, but a lot of times anger mm -hmm. and a lot of times addiction and depression. So it mm -hmm. comes out and oftentimes people can't name it, right? Like, because if you've been taught that we don't talk about it, so our, our society, not only is the church kind of grief avoidant, but our society is grief avoidant, right? right. Like you should sort it's like it's a problem to be conquered instead of an experience to be lived through. And so if that's what you think, that stoicism is equal to strength and, um, you know, I ended like conquer this hill mm -hmm. and climb these five steps and then I'm done and I fixed this problem in my life. Well, then you know, it doesn't leave a lot of room for like exploring that and living that and saying like, you know, and kind of being curious about like how you feel and what can I learn and um, how does this change me or it doesn't leave room for any of the wilderness of grief, right? Because we're going to, we're going to shut that down. Right. And eventually though, it, it, it stays within us and eventually we see people act out or be depressed or have anger. And oftentimes that comes up in more intimate relationships in their family. Yeah, yeah. It's unhealthy or even physical issues. You know, like people's physical health can be um, hurt. I mean, in the best of circumstances, when people do fully grieve, they can still have physical issues from grief, especially when mm -hmm. they've like been a caregiver or there was a lot of shock and trauma involved. I mean, people have, you know, Heart, there's like an, I can't remember the name of it now, but there is actually a term for people that actually have heart attacks from it, you know, or people wow. get their uh, immune system is compromised by exhaustion and things. So when I mean, we see that a little bit more in elderly people, but it is true that it can take a real toll on your whole self. You know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah. spiritual, emotional, 
like we expect the emotional, right. but it's also physical and mental and, um, and spiritual. And so, uh, you know, it, it comes out, it's gonna, we're gonna have it, whether we honor it and let it sort of have its place and allow ourselves to express it or not. Um, it'll just seep out and usually in very unhealthy ways. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I, I like what you said, we're going to have it. Like we're going to have grief. It's just a matter of how it's expressed and how it's um, accepted by us, I guess is a, a good term. Yeah. Yeah, often people will sit down there, their rear end will hit the couch and they'll say, so how long am I going to feel like this and how can we fix it? Mm. And then I get to be the bearer of the, to them, bad news that mm. it takes time, not just time, but I mean, it's not, you, you know, I, I don't have three steps and then you're done, you know, yeah. and it feels bad. I mean, there's a reason we avoid grief because it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really terrible. I mean, like, I'm not saying I'm not trying to romanticize grief. It's really bad. I actually, I mean, I actually thought I would have to be taken to the hospital. Mm. I would cry so hard and so long and like throw up and could not calm down. And I would just think, I don't know what I thought the hospital would do. Maybe just sedate me. I don't know. Right. But I just thought like, I don't like, I, I can't make it stop. You know, I can't. And so it, it's terrifying. People are like, I don't want to be like this forever. You know, and I understand that. I have been there. I have wanted something just to make it stop and quit. Yeah. Um, but all of that expression, eventually that mourning, that's what mourning is. Grief is what we feel. Mourning is how we express it. And so any of that expression, whether it's crying or having a memorial service or talking to a friend or whatever, it, it helps create some movement and some, you know, some space and room and allows mm -hmm. us to sort of process that, our loss. So yeah. um, it's needful. Yeah. So is grief cyclical? Like, does it come back? I, I'm, I heard somebody describe one time their own experience and they say, I keep coming back to this grief and I keep mourning in different ways, mm. but I don't, they're not wallowing in it. Mm -hmm. They're talking like years, like, like yeah. some sort of cycle. And I know in myself, there's these seasons that come when I miss my grandparents who died when I was in my twenties, where I miss my, my, my friend who died by suicide in, in my teens, when I miss my mom, when, you know, in the, and not just triggered by like, dates and anniversaries or by things that remind you of them, but just a genuine sort of sadness that sort of sits on you. I mean, is that, when does grief stop expressing itself and just sort of settle down, I guess, or does it? I mean. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know when. I would not, I would use the word recursive in mm. that it, we do revisit it. You know, I don't know that I would call it like a, cycle like we think of like it's just like predictably yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever but it's it, it does I think the best I can kind of put it into words and, and the best I can understand it from a and this is a totally non-clinical sort of point here this is a mm -hmm. observation and my own experience and watching other people being with other people I think we just run into our loss at different times um yeah. the reality of it you know like so maybe you grieve the loss of your mom. Um, I want to use this as an example. I don't know if this happened to you, but let's say when you had your kids, mm -hmm. like maybe you'd never thought about that before. And then you have children and then you all of a sudden like that grief is very fresh because yeah. this new place in your life that your mom is missing from. Right. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's really like, you know, direct, like you can kind of connect the dots. Right. Sure. Sometimes it just, who knows? Like, I don't know why, you know, like it just kind of comes out, seeps out somehow. And, and I think it's sometimes I think it's because we like somehow have encountered their absence in a way maybe we had not before, you know, some little area or just we experienced something. I know when I walked across the stage, 
to get my master's degree. I wore my mother's master's stole because counseling is an education. My mom was a teacher. So we both had our master's of education and I wore her master's stole. And I tell you, I, it took all I could to stay upright. I, I wanted to just squall walking across that stage. I missed my mom yeah. so much, but yeah. I was so happy. I mean, like I didn't really, I mean, I kind of felt it. I felt it but not like that, whoo, that taking your breath away, you know? So yeah. we have moments that are not like, maybe we anticipate like birthdays or death anniversaries and things like that. But we, right. some things we don't, um, you know, like we're not, we don't really anticipate them, you know, yeah. they just they come all over us. And I just think, um, I just think when we love someone, and they are part of our life, that there's always a hole. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. People are not replaceable. And so, I, I, my very <laughs> uh, non answer answer is that I just think that we feel that absence in different ways throughout our life. And, um, Sometimes it makes us sad and sometimes it's just more of a melancholy and sometimes mm -hmm. it's almost comforting because you, it's a way that you feel, it, you, you know, you, it's still like a link to them almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it does make sense. It does. I don't think, I think there's a misunderstanding of grief. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did the five stages of grief, which she never she actually researched terminally ill patients, not lost survivors. So she mm. did not even like the research was not even done on people that had lost someone. That was, it was done on people who were dying. Right. And so not that her findings were not um, valid in any way, but she never even her, she herself has said, she just got so angry about people just kind of simplifying it to this sort mm -hmm. of stair step sort of idea, which is not what she intended at all. And so even though I do believe all of those would be components of grief and obviously mm -hmm. some come before others, like accepting the reality would ha obviously have to come before some of the others. Um, there's this, it gives this idea to some people that there's some finish line, you know, mm -hmm. like I went through all these five steps and I reached acceptance and then ta-da, I'm done. I mean, they don't yeah. say it like that, but that's kind of the, you know, and I just call that wishful thinking. <laughs> um, because it's not true. It's, yeah. I think we reach a place of reconciliation with our loss. We can, mm -hmm. where we are sort of reconciled to it and with it. And it's sort of a part of us. So maybe we don't, aren't still, but then I still think we have moments of wrestling and, and sadness. And, you know, I don't know that any of it's clean cut, right? It's messy. It's illogical. Yeah. 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 I really like what you said that the the person remains absent. Like we don't somehow get over grief and their spot in our life evaporates or gets filled or because it doesn't. Right. That's so true. And yeah, I used to think of grief as a finish line. And I wondered when I stopped when I would stop grieving my mom. Um, and now I, I through my own therapy and through just living with it, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's just, it's, it's recursive. I think that's a great word for it. it yeah. Have you heard that? I know, I'm sure, I don't know, you're younger than me, so I don't know if you're big Eagles fans, but they, they do a song, uh, more a more recent song, not one of, it's not as one of their older ones. Uh, I don't even know the real name of it, but there's a hole in the world tonight. Hmm. Have you heard the by the Eagles? There's I think so on the radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought of that song a lot. You know, like there's just, it makes a difference when someone dies. It does. It makes a difference. I mean, not, not just in that moment, but like, you know, from us for me, and they live of, I think, like, I think my mom, you know, I, I access her wisdom a lot, you know, like sometimes when I'm wondering about things, I think, what would my mom say or whatever? Yeah. But in, and then of course I am who I am, virtue of relationships, right? Like, I mean, that has, 
has molded me and made me. So my marriage, I was married 30 years to Phil. I was um, 50 when my mom passed away. So um, there's a, in that sense, they live on, you know, they're not just there. I mean, there's, I feel, I feel that, but there really is a difference. I mean, like if we don't, that kind of goes back to this idea of what do we believe about lives and people and, you know, do we genuinely believe in the preciousness and the uniqueness of each human life? Mm -hmm. And so I think of that song sometimes, you know, when I think about my life is different, I think um, that just that line, you know, yeah. there's a hole, there's a hole in the world tonight. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, uh, I think sometimes people hear me talk and probably think I'm the most negative person. I'm not negative <laughs> and I'm not yeah, hopeless. You yeah. You don't seem that way at all. I think I'm just, realistic. Yeah. But I, I feel like more of a realism, more of a, a, a willingness. And I was dragged kicking and screaming. So this is not like I just, you know, had, this is all hindsight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, like sort of a willingness to sort of um, go into that wilderness of grief and to let your let myself feel that. And I think that's why it doesn't really scare me anymore mm -hmm. um, as far as like the reoccurring. I mean, I don't want to lose anyone else, obviously, but like as far as like when it comes up about my mom or or my late husband. Um, I don't know. It doesn't really frighten me anymore um, when I have questions that are. You know, when I have questions about God, I had all kinds of questions about it. I could not pray. When my husband died, I could not pray. Yeah. And I will never forget, like, I can't remember where I was, like in the doctor or something. And I was talking to some woman and she said, oh, I bet you being a minister has helped you in your grief so much. I bet your faith has helped you so much. And I just, I had to go sit in the car. <clears throat> I cried. I felt yeah. like a failure. Um, but I couldn't pray. I would just cry. Like, I, it was just like, I didn't have any words, you know? Yeah. And so I think at first that scared me mm -hmm. because I thought it meant I had like lost my faith. Right. Right. Because I was not really ever given permission to ask questions or to um, be angry at God right. or to be angry at anyone, quite frankly, as a woman in Christian yeah. world. Like, don't be mad at anybody. So, um, but, you know, now I have the assurance that I've gone through that. And, um, you know, God was there. I mean, I didn't, I didn't lose God because I got mad and laid on the floor and kicked and screamed and said, what the hell happened to my life? Right. God didn't recoil in horror and say, Jan, I'm done with you, you know. Right. <laughs> um. I mean, I think, so I think I don't fear the turmoil like I used to. I don't love it, but I don't yeah. fear it like I did to begin with. Yeah. And I think also there's a component of when you go through grief, sort of like in waves, you survive a wave of it, you realize I can survive this. This, mm -hmm. isn't, this isn't even though my brain is telling me that there's some sort of self death and self danger involved, I can survive this. This isn't going right. to, this isn't going to end me. Mm -hmm. That's really hard when you lose somebody that you love to come to that place though. It's yeah. And I think so, early on, you know, we don't have that confidence obviously. And then, like down the road, let's say, you know, a few months down the road, sometimes people will start having better days and then have a bad day mm -hmm. where they feel that wave again. And they'll be like, I'm starting all over. And I'm like, no, let's just think right. about it. Right. <laughs> Is it really the same as, the, as at the beginning? And they're like, no. And I'm like, did you survive the worst day? They're like, yes. I'm like, okay. Like, so, you know, you do, you're right. You kind of learn like, and maybe that's a good way to put it. You learn to ride the waves a little bit, yeah. you know, you learn to hang on and, you know, and yeah. you learn to handle that a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. So. so one last question for you. And, and sure. I think this is really important. Um, 
everything that we've talked about with grief and how it comes out and its relationship to faith and all this, what does it actually do to the way that you articulate the gospel? Like, we say the gospel is good news, but there's a sense of grief in the gospel, even in the story of, I mean, I think of the disciples losing Mary, losing her son. There's that grief that's built into this story that we all say is good news. But what does that do to how we talk about the good news or how you do? I mean, it's different for everybody because we all go through our own grief, but you've been through a lot. What does that do to, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what does that do to how you, how you speak about the good news? I don't really believe in happy, clappy faith anymore. And so I think I'm much more, um, I, I don't do this with every client, it depends on sort of their faith background and what they kind of want right. in session. But, you know, I said to a client the other day, you know, like, they were expressing like some fear and doubt and, but you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm afraid to feel this or to say this or whatever. Um, and I think it has expanded my view of God's love, which sounds really counterintuitive probably, but um, you know, I think often, and I say often to, cl to clients that God is near to the brokenhearted. Um, it has erased any idea within me that if we do the right things, we are spared um, heartache because that's not true. N nor can we do enough to do that anyway, right? But if we even thought we could check a checklist, you know, seen wonderful, beautiful people be shipwrecked by, by death and loss yeah. and heartache. And so I think in some ways it's made me focus more on the love of God and it's given me a more expansive view um, I feel like when I talk to people, I'm not really so much concerned anymore about steps or, I don't know, like this defined little box. I'm probably a lot more, right. um, I, my supervisor uh, in my internship was a, did chaplaincy work and was also an ordained minister and, but also a licensed counselor. Mm -hmm. So he'd done like tons of work in Emory Hospital in Atlanta, which is a huge hospital in like downtown Atlanta. Right. So years and years of work with people that were dying and, you know, just had horrible things happening. So, but I sat with him when I first started working and doing my internship. And I can remember this woman was so afraid that God was mad at her. And that's why this, her son had died. Mm -hmm. Somehow that was like a punishment, Right. right. And I can remember him saying the most beautiful thing to her. And, and this might sort of sum up to me, like what I hope for when I speak, not just to my clients, but how I embody uh, the love and the gospel, the love of God and the gospel to others. He said, I hope that your, it is my prayer for you that your view of God and his love for you expands. And that it is not so limited by um, fear and by, um, you know, like that you can, that you can really understand the breadth of God's love for you. And I think that that might, I don't know if that really answers your question, but like, I just don't have any more. I don't, I'm not real concerned with, um, you know, like the four steps or whatever, right. you know, like I don't, I don't even like, I think it's just more of a, and I think it's given me a heart for people more. I've always been a people person and I was in ministry for a long time, but I think there's just this um, lack of judgment now, like an ability to really be with people and to really share the love of God in a very concrete, hands-on yeah. um, way without a lot of the concerns that maybe came up um, in ministry. I, I feel like, um, I don't know, maybe it's just made me more open to the part of the gospel about the suffering of Christ, right? You know, it's just not yeah. cheap. It's not cheap. It's not, yeah. um, 
I feel like I'm doing a very bad job answering this question. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's beautiful. <laughs> but I feel like um, even in my own doubt and anger and questions and wondering, I feel like uh, I realized that my a lot of times I was limiting, you know, what I believed about God's love and what I believed about myself, what I must do to be worthy, even though we say that, like we know, oh, we can't be worthy. And, uh, you know, we still believe it to some degree that there's something we must do to be acceptable or whatever. And I think when you're just crushed <laughs> and you can't get up off the floor and you see people in that state, you know, you, you recognize that God is near in that. He loves you in that. All the questions, all the doubts, all the fears, all the anger, you know, there's a compassion and a grace. Um, and so I think, I think I just have a, maybe I have a bigger view of God than I did before. Yeah. Sounds like it. Mm. I love that answer. I love it. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom. Um, so if people want to follow you on social media, where can they find you? Well, um on uh, twitter it's uh at jan j owen i do warn you i'm i'm a little political at times <laughs> <laughs> i don't just talk about grief <laughs> <laughs> and i also share a lot about my dog so <laughs> and <laughs> <about> football, so <laughs> there you go <laughs> but um uh, i don't really have my like facebook open publicly because i'm sure. a but I do have a couple of professional pages on Instagram and on Facebook under my practice name, which is Back Porch Counseling. And I, I, I try to uh, post a couple times a week things about mental health or grief or just, okay. you know, things that I feel like are kind of helpful in that way. So it's not like really personally there. Sure, sure. Twitter, that is a personal page on Twitter and I don't mind new followers. Um, I just give the little, <laughs> I just give the warning at a time that I do that warning. on Twitter that I am on. <laughs> but, um, That's great. Yeah. And then you, you have I, a website too, right? Excuse me? You have a website too? Well, I do. I do have uh, my personal website, um, which is just Jan J Owen, like the letter J, Jan, the letter J Owen.com. Because uh, okay. Dan Owen is never available because Dan Owen apparently was some famous uh, British songwriter that wrote songs for the Beatles. So anyway, wow. <laughs> so, so nothing is ever, even though I have, a, I think it's kind of an unusual name. People, you know, it's never available. But anyway, yeah, no. in there. and my book's on Amazon. It's not hard to find. So um, what's the book called again? Fighting Forward, um, A Widow's Journey from Loss to Life. And it is uh, not just for widows. It's just any kind of loss or difficult life transition. I think it can be helpful for. So um, anyway, that's, uh, I don't, um, I try to, um, also I do some like, uh, not really speaking right now, I guess, because of COVID, but I do some right. like consultation with churches and with businesses about grief policies or about mental health in the workplace and things like that too. So well, that's great. And always interested to talk to pastors about mi widows ministry, but I don't get yeah. taken up on that very often. But I do, if if there's a question, I do don't mind discussing that with pastors. I, I appreciate that opportunity. So that's great. Well, I'll put links to everything in the show notes so people okay. can find you. Um, again, thank you so much. This has been just a beautiful conversation. Well, I've enjoyed um, it. I appreciate the opportunity to to. Um, to discuss it because I don't really get that, you know, in therapy, I don't, you know I'm saying? Like it's not, really, right. yeah, it's not quite the same. Right. So it's kind of nice to, to be able to flesh out some of these thoughts and talk and to have the conversation. Yeah. I thank you for having me on. Thank you. Well, I will let you get on with your day. Uh, okay. Thank you again. And we'll talk again sometime. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.